Hi everyone, my name is Lillian Walker Shelton and I am an author originally from Philadelphia but now I live in the DC metro area. I've been writing, this This is my actual first real project. The other projects that I've done have been maybe like affiliated with school or something like that but this is the first major independent project that I have done. So many different things really influenced me to be a writer. The first thing really would be my uncle and my mentor, uh, Charles Fuller, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Growing up my whole life, I knew about his plays, I knew about his like movies that he did screenplays for, I knew about all of his writings and so that was really influential to me uh, when I first like thought about writing. But then for the particular project that I did now, um, I wanted to do something that would be a multicultural book written by an African American woman about different women's perspectives. Um, I thought that it would be important to do something like this because a lot of times you may have books by African American women, but they're just about African American women characters. But this book has like multiracial characters in it. So the title of the book is Amelia's Song, and the book is about four different women who go on a delegation in, to Guatemala, and once they go there, um, the science fiction kind of part of the book happens where they're part of a magical spell. Now, I don't want to ruin it for everybody because it's really kind of, it's a lot of mysteries to the book and a lot of like uh, things like, oh, I didn't see that coming, so I don't want to give away the whole book, but that's the storyline of it. Um, you have a character that is uh, European American. Um, her name is Sarah. Um, even though she's, I said European American, but even though she's white, her husband is black and um, she works at a law firm. You have another character named Felicity. Um, she's black and she lives in the poorest part of Southeast DC and she's a child care worker. And then you have another character named Gloria who is actually Guatemalan and she works down uh, on a Guatemala, uh, on a banana plantation in Guatemala. Um, the fourth and supporting character is, ne is named May and May is Thai and um, the interesting thing about the character May is that May is actually transgender and I decided to have a transgender character in my book because of, of how transgendered women are now coming more into the women's movement and I thought that it would be important to also kind of well have, have exposure to their lives and some of the things that they deal with. So I'm really glad you asked that. Part one of the book is called Women's Ballads. You get background on each one of the four main characters. You get to see what their independent struggles are and what they're going through. Uh, part two of the book, which is called Indigenous In Incantations, when they're down in uh, Guatemala, you see all of the characters meet. Uh, part three of the book, Musical Chairs, is back to the women's individual lives, but they do overlap some because they're helping each other at this point. And then uh, part four of the book, Eternal Melody, at the end part you also get to see what happens to them at the end of the story after they finish helping each other. I, I wanted to do it because I think that, you know, she has a story to tell. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, work with um, an organization that represents transgender people who have issues in the workplace in DC and um, it's like the DC Trans uh, Union and they were trying to help trans people who were having just workplace issues and from getting to know those people I got to know more about their story and about their struggle and you know what brought them to the place where they said you know I feel like that I have maybe been assigned the wrong gender and I want to correct that and I think that you know just considering that considering uh, the media frenzy around Caitlyn Jenner uh, considering you know what happened with, with gay marriage I think that we're moving into a time where we have to redefine um, some things some categories that we all you know thought that we had set up in our mind before and one of those categories is what gender is and what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman
Absolutely, I think so. It's it's a different time. It's a changing time. You know, it's funny um, when I talk to my grandmother, who is 96 years old, uh, speaking about Obama when he first became president eight years ago. She said to me, "I never thought I would live to see the day where we had a, a African American president, a black president of the United States of America, considering the strong history that we've had of racism and injustice." Um, so that really played in mind to it. But then, like you said, going back to like the relationship aspect of okay, you know, you have people who are in a, in interracial relationships, and, and what does that really mean? And and, you know, for the woman who's in my book, Sarah, she's white, her husband is black, but then also she has a white collar job and he has a blue collar job. So looking at that and what does that mean too? But then also like, you know, you may have the two people who are in the core part of the relationship, the man and the woman, but then what do their family members feel about the relationship? And that's explored a little bit in my book also, you know, how do they really, how do they really, really feel that their family is with somebody who is of a, of a different race? I think for for me with like writing at home, like my husband, he just was always just so proud of me. He knew about my uncle being a writer and he was like, okay, you know, and he would see me at night sometimes just turn off the TV and just be writing. He's like, oh, you're just writing your book. That, that's wonderful. He's, he's really supportive of it. But uh, for some of the technical things about the book, the mechanical things about the book, what I did, I went to my friends who are writers. Like I have a good friend named Callie Shanafel. She's a journalist. And I went to her and I said, okay, I'm trying to give these people's voice. How, you know, how do I do that? And she told me how to do it and how to think about it when I was writing. And then also too, you know, because their part of the book takes place in Guatemala. So I went to like uh, my friends who are Guatemala. Guatemala and then also I had been to Guatemala myself so you know I had other I had research like you know and I and an acknowledgments of the book I try to like thank people who really helped me be able to put it all together and who really supported me com completely through the project. Well um in 2008, I had an opportunity to go to Guatemala with a women's group um, that is no longer in existence. Um, but we went there to do kind of like a worker exchange where uh, we were women who were workers in the United States and we got to see what women who were workers in Guatemala were doing. And so we had someone who worked at a job training facility, someone who was a union organizer. We had two students. Uh, we had me, um, and I'm trying to think of who else we had. Had. I can't think of the other person right now at the moment, but when we went down there, uh, we had an opportunity to go and do things like go to a textile factory and see how women make clothes there, but they're paid very poorly. Uh, we had opportunity to go to uh, a banana plantation and see how, you know, uh, they pick bananas and they're packaged and they're sent to the United States. And um, the interesting thing about that that I tell people and I just think it's so funny, you know, you have all these movies like I Am Legend and Terminator about the end of the world and how there's like no people left on the planet and everything like that. And, you know, I think whoever wrote these movies, they have never been to a banana plantation in Guatemala because the way that it is, you go and the whole place is behind a giant wall. So you're like, what's going on behind the wall? And you go in through this gate, and behind the wall is basically a whole city of people. You know, when we went, I mean, people were coming out of everywhere, you know. And I'm like, wow, it's so many folks. This is just amazing. You would never think all of this exists behind the wall on, on the banana plantation, but that that's there. So going there, that was just such a, an experience for me. And um, that's when I learned too about being relational with people because I, I don't speak any Spanish at all, but you know, because I would smile and look friendly, you know, people would always come up and talk to me and they would say things to me and then I would look at my friend like, what did they say? And she would tell me. So, you know, going, going on that trip was like a, a big turning point in my life because I saw the, the thing that, the biggest thing I came away with was, you know, in the United States we have poverty and we struggle, but when you talk about the poverty in other countries and how the workers are paid, poor, you know, paid there, it is nothing compared to what we deal with in our country. You know, they may get paid $7 a day 
they may get paid $25 every two weeks, you know, and um, because of the fact that they don't have the, the labor laws that we have here. So that really struck such a strong chord with me when I came away from there. Well, I mean, it's just, and that's that's such a great question. I'm glad you asked that because with my friends um, who are in the women's movement, who are feminists, we always talk about how the, you know, the European American women, the white women's movement is totally separate from our women's movement because there are studies that have been done that say still in 2015, you know, women get paid less than men, but white women still get paid more than black women. I mean, and that's just a, a natural fact. You know, we it, it's something different. And then also in terms of, like you were saying about the standard of career, you know, you look at the career choices and the options that, that have been afforded to them compared to the career choices and the options that have been afforded to us, it's also something totally different. In that category, you know, black men have more of an advantage than, than black women. And, and just kind of bringing it home and even looking at like you know with, with the book with Amelia's song uh, the the african-american woman in the book Felicity she works as a child care worker and um, she most of her money that she gets she has to share it with her family because her mother doesn't work and you know her brother doesn't really work and so she's taking just the child care worker salary and, and supporting them you know so it is a whole different standard of, of what it means and I think it's really it really is addressed in, in the book and you get to see it but you know I don't know what it, it's going to take I think that um, it's interesting when um, they said and I think I forget her name but I know her last name is Arquette. Uh, she gave a speech earlier this year at one of these award ceremonies about women and you know and women fighting for rights and a lot of African-American women answered well she didn't really address our issues too so I think it, it we have had two separate movements now where I can say it has overlapped a lot is the movement that's closest to me and that's the labor movement that what happened in the labor movement is that a lot of times when you had the rights that were given to uh, maybe white women they were the same white rights that were given to black women too and that's why you see a lot of black women try to get jobs that are union jobs maybe you know working in public service like a bus operator or you know even telephone operator or or other things and these are good jobs that you know you can turn into a career and, and make a living wage off of but you know there's still so many other areas of, of women's inequality and you know it, it's still so much more to even push for um, just even considering how we're respected and how and how we're treated uh, in, in the public So the book itself is only available on Amazon Kindle. Um, these days to get a book printed, it takes a lot of money. So a lot of new authors are going the electronic route where you just have it available on the internet. But the cool thing about Kindle is that you can download the app and you can read it on any device. I mean your phone, your tablet, and your computer, you can read the book that way. I mean, you know, that's a heavy order. That's a really heavy and a tall order to be able to say that I could do something that was achieved by my uncle to be a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. Would I like to be a Pulitzer Prize winning writer? Absolutely. But I think what happened for me is that when, um, because I'm not a writer, you know, by trade, um, my career is I'm a counselor. And right now, you know, I'm a counselor education student. So, um, you know, when, people said oh you wrote a book they know that I'm a counselor they know that I work with like um, low-income people they know you know that I work with people who are severely mentally ill they're like I didn't think that you would write so you know what happened for me is that I would would tell people okay I, I did write something and I was mentored in my writing by my uncle who was a Pulitzer Prize winning writer who you know got nominated for an Academy Award and even more importantly where it came into my process is once I was finished writing a whole thing I gave him the book to read because I wanted to know if this was something that made sense because you know you have something that you write or you produce as an artist and you're like this is great 
but is it something that should be released into the public and once I gave it to him and he looked at it and he really he took his time editing it he took his time giving me feedback you know it was really great and it helped me a lot and it let me know okay this is something and he also gave me recommendations for uh, things to use about writing and expounding upon different areas in the book so that's where he came in in, in the process and everything and I, I definitely I, I mentioned him in the acknowledgments of the book for his his mentoring during during the process and and, and what I was going to say too I think that what you you know what Charles Fuller provided for me too was honest experienced feedback because I think that a lot of people they want to produce things and they don't understand that you need to get a critical eye to look it over to give you feedback you know like when giving it to him he was able to say okay you need to do this you need to do that I've read a lot of books by people who are hustling their book and you know and I'm like this is wonderful this is great but did you have somebody who was a professional editor look at your book you know did you have somebody who's a professional writer look at this and you know if that's the case then it's it's hard you know my friend was telling me that she read a book by someone they didn't have the book edited so it was hard for her to read so I think that the recommendations you get from people who have experience in the field really are beneficial to you they're not trying to rain on your parade but they're giving you really helpful criticism because we all know that if you look at something and you've just been looking at it looking at it you're not going to realize any of the mistakes that you may have made with it Well, I think the thing about it is, like, you have to, number one, believe in yourself. You know, believe in the stories that you're telling for people. And, you know, that will motivate you and encourage you so much more. The thing about it is people have more people in their network than they absolutely realize. And a lot of my book, it's oddly enough that it's just on the internet. A lot of the help from my book came from the internet and came from like social media. So once, you, you know, uh, uh, Charles Fuller and another one of my friends, Damon Agnos, got back to me and said, hey Lil, get, a, get, get yourself a professional copy editor to look at this book. And when I put it on social media, it was so crazy because people just answered the call. And, and so just from those things, then also you have to look at like the connections and the network that you have. You know, I for for years before um, I became a student, I worked as a social justice activist with DC Jobs with Justice. And so I did so much stuff in the labor movement. Uh, there's a labor element in my book. So when I came out with the book, I went to my friends in the labor movement. I said, hey, you know, I've been helping you for a long time. And can you help me? And they said, absolutely, we'll help you, Lily. So from that, I was able to do like a radio interview on the public radio station down there. Um, I had an article written up about me in the labor uh, like newsletter that they have come out every day. So I think what you have to do is just think about, okay, I want to write something. I want something to get out in the public. How can I really do it? You know, who do I know that can really help me? And but the way you even go about asking is just to put the word out and just put it out there. And folks really answered the call once I put it out on social media, um, and I was surprised. Like, yeah, that's how I got somebody to make my website. That's how I got someone to do a copy editing for me, and that's how I, I got some interviews. Well, they can go to my website. It's www.ameliasong.com, E-M-I-L-I-A-S-S-O-N-G.com. And from there, you can be directed to the Facebook page, to the Twitter page, to the Instagram page. And also, um, you can reach out. I'm, there's Amelia Song on YouTube, which, you know, this video and interview will be on there. And, you know, so they can reach me that way. And uh, they can send me an email at song. 2015 at gmail.com. I want to say, you know, thank you for this opportunity. But I think also, too, what you're trying to create here is really wonderful. There's a lot of people who are artists and they need a platform. And all they need is a chance to get exposed. And who knows from, you know, maybe people you know, maybe people I know, they'll get the exposure that they need. They need to get it out there. But all it just takes is just motivation, you know, and just taking that step and saying, okay, let me send you a message. Let me contact you and say, I want to come and talk about my project too. So it, it can be done. But thank you for providing that platform for people who are trying. Mm -hmm.